Hebrews chapter 2, second chapter of Hebrews. Uh, we're working on the uh, PATH radio program. Um, <clears throat> got the first uh, kind of prototype done. Uh, tomorrow, Rochelle and I are going to be meeting to do her. She's going to be doing a weekly update about news, <clears throat> news items here in the United States of America dealing with uh, trafficked humans. We're linked into our federal government's website on the anti-trafficking movement from the, around the United States of America, getting uh, daily updates out of the government on victories that are being won, those that are being rescued. <clears throat> I want to just tell you this morning, I'm really, this is kind of eating my lunch. The, the more we've gotten into this and working with Gary Vale over at 99.5 and Rochelle and Louise Allison uh, of PATH, Partners Against Trafficking Humans, as I was working this last week, <clears throat> I've got Louise's uh, testimony and putting this first program together as it might look week to week, and as I just listened several times to Louise's testimony, how as a 13-year-old girl, she was taken off the streets and for years started being trafficked. As, can you imagine as a 13-year-old girl? And the years that she spent uh, being sold and the, the drug addictions and the depression and the desire to commit suicide. And, and it's not just Louise's stories. I just listened to that and I was thinking, you know, right now in the United States there's over 20,000. In the United States today there are over 20,000 of these young people that are being sold on the streets of America. I got up this morning and I'm thinking, somewhere there's a girl right now are 10 or 100. Um, let's pray about this. Uh, we, you know, somebody was talking uh, on Facebook a couple weeks ago, you know, about the rightness or wrongness of uh, being involved, like against terrorism. Is it right or wrong, you know, to go kill terrorists? From a Christian standpoint. And some people were, you know, they said, well, Jesus said, love your enemies. You know, do good unto them that despitefully use you and hate you. And it's like, we're supposed to do good to these people that are going to come over here and kill us, and they're killing. Have you seen what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, where they're just going in and whole villages of Christians killing, raping, digging trenches, burying them alive with bulldozers? We're supposed to do good to that? I'm thinking, give me a break. <clears throat> and I responded on that, and I said, you know, if, if you see evil like that happening and have the resource and ability to address it, and if you don't address it, that's evil. That's evil. And so I, I've been thinking about that, not just about terrorism, but now it's in this human trafficking thing. It's, you know, it's under the shadow of our steeple. We're here at the crossroads, Interstate 40 and 30 in the United States. We're at the crossroads of human trafficking in this nation. And today there's 20,000 kids being trafficked. And it's just in my head, it's under the shadow of our steeple. It's right here. How can we know that and do nothing and call ourselves the people of God? So, be in prayer for us. Uh, I mean that seriously. Be in prayer for Louise and Pat, the Partners Against Trafficking Humans, and, you know, in the entire United States, out of those 20,000-something kids being trafficked, there's only 1,000 beds. There's only 1,000 beds that can receive them to rescue them in this whole nation. I say beds. I'm not talking about facilities. I'm talking about beds there's only eight facilities in this whole nation to rescue. And one of them's literally under the shadow of our steeple. And we have an opportunity uh, to work with them. So pray, we're going to be calling the program Path Saves. Path Saves. So um, I guess pray I get a stronger heart. <laughs> 
because it's kind of broken. I thought, I've got a daughter. What if somebody would have grabbed my daughter as a 14-year-old and started selling her on the streets and starving her to death and injecting drugs into her veins? And, and it can happen. It does happen all across this nation. So I just really want to urgently call us to pray and ask God to anoint with a Holy Ghost anointing this effort to shed the light on human trafficking in our nation. Will you join with us in prayer? Um, we appreciate that. All right, Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm going to read a whole chapter. Do you think we can handle that? A whole chapter? I'd love to read the whole book of Hebrews, but I'll settle for a chapter. Oh, by the way, our stewardship committee, they've found a brilliant plan for retiring the debt on our new building in five years. And it's brilliant. Would you like to hear what it is? Here, we, we went through, I had Susan go through, our, Susan's our secretary, I had Susan go through and, and figure out the number of households represented in our church, okay, households. And then we cut that number in half. <laughs> I, now, not to mean that half of you aren't important. We were just trying to be realistic, okay, realistic. We took the total number of households, because some are widows and single parents and things. We cut that number in half, and, we've, and we went to a website and got the average income of a household in our area, all right? So we got the total number of households, and we cut it in half, and figured out if that one half of our households um, tithe weekly, based on the average income for our specific area, if one half did, uh, we would have an extra over $400,000 a year in our general budget that we could apply to the debt service and we'd pay it off in five years. Does that sound like a deal? Everybody say, everybody say amen. <laughs> So we wouldn't have to be asking you to give extra, you know, have a big capital needs campaign and bring in a company and pay them $40,000 to try to help us eke more money out of those that are already giving, amen? If just one half of our households. Oh, and, and I love it when somebody says, well, you know, tithing, that's an Old Testament thing. It's not a New Testament thing. I just love to hear that. Because <laughs> I know that person hadn't read the red letter. Jesus. Jesus addressed it. Do you know that, don't you? You know, the Pharisees, they were always trying to cause trouble, trying to cause arguments and all that kind of stuff. And the Pharisees, they were talking about tithing. You know, how, what should you tithe on? It's kind of like we, we argue about, should you tithe before or after taxes? Well, that's kind of what they were doing, you know. And so uh, they, they were talking about tithing, you know, like every little piece of mint, you know, that you use in cooking and stuff like that. And Jesus said, well, you should do that. So right there, red letter, Jesus Christ said, you should, you bet you should, but you also should not ignore the weightier things of love and justice and mercy. So just also be praying with us uh, about, we, we would really like to pay that building off, amen? Um, and pray about your part in doing that. Okay, PATH, Partners Against Trafficking Humans, and, um, and this debt service. It hangs over our head. It's a heavy weight, amen? It's a big burden. It's a great building, and we use every inch of it, amen, for the glory of God. <clears throat> and God led us there, so, but it's time. It's time to really get serious about paying that off. All right, so let's, uh, let's pray. I'd like to ask Terry James, would you mind standing up right there and leading us in prayer, please, sir?
Amen. Thank you. All right, stand with me. Hebrews chapter 2. And at the uh, close of the reading, I'll lead us in a prayer over this message today. And I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Translation. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. We must therefore pay even more attention to what we've heard so that we will not drift away. You ever seen anyone drift away? It's a sad thing, isn't it? Verse 2. For if the message spoken through angels was legally binding, and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment, many people have uh, described this question that opens verse 3 as a question that has no answer. How will we escape? if we neglect such a great salvation? How will we escape if we neglect this great salvation? It was first spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. At that time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles, and distribution of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to his will. For he's not subjected to angels, the world to come, that we're talking about. But one is somewhere testified, and this is from Psalm 8. One somewhere testified, What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing not subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him, but we do see Jesus, made lower than the angels for a short time, so that by God's grace, he might taste death for everyone crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. And this is our focus verse 10. For it was fitting in bringing many sons to glory that he, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the source, or the King James says captain, and we'll talk about that word in a moment, should make the source captain of their salvation perfect, through sufferings. We'll also talk about that word perfect. 11. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. That's from Psalm 22, verse 22. So as we were singing here this morning, what this verse just said was Jesus joined us and he was worshiping alongside of us. Amen? <laughs> Doesn't get any better than that. Verse 13. Again, I'll trust in him and again, here I am with the children God gave me. Here he is. Amen? 14. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, he also shared in these so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is, the devil. He's overcome, amen? And free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God 
to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tested and has suffered, he's able to help those who are tested. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great plan, your great design of salvation. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the work that you've done that we could never do and the purpose, your plan. Help us this morning to see your architectural wonder of salvation more clearly than ever. For your glory, for your name's sake, for your kingdom's sake, for the sake of the veracity of your word, we ask this in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The captain of salvation in verse number 10 there, the King James says, um, the Holman says, the source of their salvation. That Greek word could also be translated as an architect, as the architect of salvation. It's really kind of difficult to put into uh, one English word, the meaning of that word. Now, I like the word architect and source and captain. They're all good. Uh, yesterday, we had a Patriot Guard funeral I got to be a part of. We started off in Conway, Arkansas, there at the funeral home in Conway. And then <clears throat> the escort to the cemetery, the cemetery was all the way up almost to Clinton, Arkansas, north of B Branch. So we had a pretty good escort ride on the bikes, and uh, it was a great honor to stand uh, with the family in recognition. It was a Vietnam veteran that had died. And after it was over, a few of us got together and stopped and uh, had a bite to eat at a restaurant up there above B Branch, top of the hill restaurant, if you all know where that is, right there on the highway. And one of the riders, I'd been with him on several missions over the years uh, with the Patriot Guard, but I'd never really gotten to know him. You know how that is. And so um, as we were sitting there in our group, uh, all of a sudden he asked me, he said, well, Chuck, he said, how long have you been at Cedar Heights Baptist Church? And I was uh, a little bit surprised because I didn't re know that he had that as me associated with this particular church. I said, well... Um, we're almost 25 years now. He said, wow. He said, you must be a real patient pastor. And I said, oh, no, God sent us to a real patient church. <laughs> Amen? Very patient church. And I thank you, by the way, for being so patient these years. And he said, well, how long have you been in that new building? I thought, wow, how does he know about, you know, that, that we got a new building? I said, well, around 10 years, close to 10 years. He said, oh, he said, I didn't remember it being that long. And so I keep thinking, this guy, he knows us better than I think he knows us. And I said, well, what's your interest in our new building? And he said, oh, he said, I have a plumbing company. And when you all built that building, I did all the plumbing in it. I said, really? I said, man, I've been on the, all these missions with you, and I didn't know that. I said, well... I, so the other guy sitting there, I said, well, that, I said, that plumbing in that building is amazing. I told the guys, I said, you know, that building is a football field. Did y'all know that? This is football season, right? It's 300 feet long. That's just about 100 yards, amen? How long is the football field? By the way, what was the name of that high school team Arkansas played yesterday? Amen, Doug. <laughs> I said, how in the world? Now, when you look at that building over there, if you look at the plumbing in that building, I mean, it's 300 feet of plumb. It goes top to bottom, back, front to back, side to side. You've got two commercial kitchens. And all of the preschool rooms have their own bathrooms in them. There's two bathrooms at the far end of the building for the playground. There's water up at this end, bathrooms at this end. I, I mean, I asked that guy, what was that like as a plumber? Because, you know, he did all the plumbing before they laid the foundation. I mean, it's a concrete slab, right? So all that plumbing work had to be done before the slab was poured. 
And I, I just got to thinking with all the, you know, pipes that had to come up, and those pipes all had to come up where a wall was going to be built. You kind of get the picture of the significance of the plumbing work of that building? And I mean, when, they, when we finally poured the slab and the pipes were up and then put up the frame and the roof and then started to build the wall, uh, rooms inside of there, all those walls, uh, the commodes were right where they belong, amen? And it's, it's, it was amazing. And I said, how in the world did you do that? That had to be something. And he just kind of laughed. He said, I want to tell you something. I cannot tell you the number of hours that I spent just going over those blueprints over and over and over again to make sure that every pipe stuck up <laughs> right where it was supposed to be. He studied those blueprints. That's kind of the idea here about Jesus Christ being the captain, uh, the originator, or if you will, the architect of salvation. He's built a pretty good set of plans. The blueprints are pretty awesome. And when we go to that opening question at the start of the chapter, how will we escape if we neglect? How will we escape if we ignore this great architectural wonder that we call the plan of salvation? Let's go to the first point here this morning. We're in verse number 10. For it's fitting in bringing many sons to glory. Bringing many sons to glory. Um, you know, God has a, a part of his architectural blueprint design of salvation. We start to see right here in this 10th verse the purpose of it. Now, when we look at the blueprint plans for our building, we kind of see the purpose of it in that building. You know, that was what the blueprints were for. Well, in this 10th verse, we see the purpose, we see the outcome, if you will, the product, the end product of God's plan of salvation, and that is to bring us to glory. Amen? That's God's design. I want you to kind of get that into your, pound that into your head for a second. I mean, really focus on this. This is the architect's design, purpose, plan. This is the outcome of his plan of salvation is to bring us to glory glory. Uh, John writes in 1 John, you know, a little 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. 1st John chapter 3, verse number 2. John says, we don't yet know what we shall be. We don't yet know what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we will be as he is. That's God's design, to bring us into the glory of of Christ himself. Bring us into the glory of holiness, of purity, of a recreated, totally transfigured, transformed, resurrected, glorious sons and daughters of God. You know, if we don't get in our head, if we don't get it in our mind, God's purpose, God's plan we're going to have a really confused life down here. <laughs> we're going to have a really misdirected life. We're going to have a really, we're going to be like uh, the, the guy shadow boxing. Or we're going to be like the guy that they put, you know, the toe sack over his head. And he's trying to box to get out of that toe sack. We're going to thrash around. We're going to thrash around trying to find meaning and purpose and happiness and fulfillment in life. And if we don't realize that God's got a purpose, we're going to be like, as the Apostle Paul said, like one just boxing in the shadows with no real effort. Now, Jesus talked a lot about this. For example, Jesus, uh, he talked about stewardship a lot. We mentioned that a little bit earlier. He said, you know, why would it profit a man? Why would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his own soul? Uh, Jesus told this story. He said, there was a certain rich man. And in the eyes of um, the typical, typical American, he was really successful in life. I mean, in the eyes of the typical Jew. You know, the Jews believed, the Jews really, the time of Christ, the Jews really believed if you were a righteous person, 
that we could see, we could see the demonstration of your righteousness because God would bless you real good with a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> The more you could accumulate, the more that you could uh, get upon you, the more success you had in life, the bigger business, the bigger income, the better retirement plan, the nicer car, the bigger house. <laughs> oh, God had blessed you indeed. That was the way they thought. Like a lot of Americans, amen? <laughs> the only problem was Jesus told these guys that had that idea, there was a certain rich man, and he had all the stuff in the world, and he had to build bigger barns to store all of the stuff he had accumulated. And all the Jews are thinking, well, what a blessed man he was indeed. He must have lived in Morgan, Marche, Oak Grove, because all we're building around here is more storage build buildings, Amen. There was a certain rich man, and he built all these buildings, and he said, oh, ho, 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 ha, I've got it all. Sit back, eat, drink, and be merry. And Jesus, to the shock and dismay of the listeners, said, you are a fool. It's the only person Jesus called a fool. You're a fool. Tonight your soul will be required of you. And that night waking up in hell, he lifted his eyes and said, Father Abraham, can you imagine? Have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to come put a drop of water on my tongue. He was a fool. Oh, he had the American mentality of stuff. They didn't know God's plan, architectural wonder of salvation. That God's goal is not necessarily our goal. What do you think? Do you think, we, do you think it'd be uh, wise for us to know God's goal for us? I want you to turn to Romans 8, the book of Romans chapter 8. We all know the introduction here in Romans 8 uh, to verse 28. I'm not so sure we know the rest of the verse or the verse that follows it. Romans 8, all right? Ver verse 28. You there, Romans chapter 8? We know, verse, uh, Romans 8, 28. We know. We know all things work together for good. Amen. How many of y'all ever quoted that in your life? We all have. Amen. Amen. All things work together for good. <laughs> even, when I, even when I'm going through a difficult time, a trouble, a trial, I, I believe all things work together for good. Well, what's the good they work for? Do you know that? Why don't we uh, read the rest of it, amen? Let's see here. We know all things work together for the good of those who, uh, what? Love God. We know all things work together for good to those that love God. And it goes on from there. <laughs> yeah. Those who are called according to whose purpose? His purpose? Oh, his purpose is to give me more stuff. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I need a new Mercedes Benz. Oh, well, let's read on. Okay. Let's see. According to his purpose, 29, for those he, God, foreknew, he also, oh, we love this word as Baptist, predestinated. Amen, Baptists? Y'all believe in predestination? Everybody say amen. 
It's a good Bible word, but we don't know all, we don't always know what God is predestined. We typically see that word and we automatically think, well, God's predetermined who's going to get saved. Well, let's see what the book says instead of what we might think it says. Because it's in black and white right here on this, look at this, 29. For those he foreknew, he also predetermined, predestined, what? That they would be conformed to the image of his son. So that he'd be the firstborn among many brothers. That sounds a whole lot like Hebrews 2, doesn't it? What God has determined, brothers and sisters, what God has designed, the architectural wonder that God's put into place, is he's designed that those of us that are saved, that we will become like Christ in character, in our nature, so that when we meet him, um, he'll feel right at home with us. And it will be for his glory. Look at that. That's the next point. For Jesus. All for Jesus. Look at this. Back, go back to Hebrews 2. Okay, I'm almost through. Suck it up, buttercup. Amen. <laughs> Hebrews 2. Verse 10. It's fitting. In other words, it's appropriate. <laughs> okay? It's fitting in bringing many sons to glory that he for whom and through whom all things exist. Here's, here's what the typical American Christian has a hard time getting in our head, is we're here for him. He ain't here for us, we're here for him. That's, that's a big leap for a lot of us. I mean, it's like as far as from the east is to the west for a lot of us. I'm here for him. I'm here for his enjoyment. I'm here for his pleasure. I'm here for his purpose. I thought, Lord, you were here to make me happy and to bless me with a lot of really neat things and to give me a, well, I won't go and give me a great wife because he did give me a great wife. Oh, you did hear about the 88-year-old um, lady that was caught. She stole a can of peaches. And she was arrested, 88 years old. So she's standing before the judge, and the judge says, what did you do, ma'am? She said, I took a can of peaches. He said, why did you take them? She looked down, and she said, because I was hungry. He said, how many peaches were in the can? She said, six. He said, I'm going to put you in jail for six days. And her 89-year-old husband said, Sir, could I say a word on my wife's behalf? And the judge said, What is that, sir? And he said, She stole a can of peas also. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Mary, I won't do that to you, baby. We're here for Jesus, Amen. I mean, if, if, my, if, my, if my number one goal in life, if my goal, if my number one purpose in this life is something other than becoming like Christ, I don't have God's goal. Oh, I may be working on my goals. <laughs> We're all trained to be goal-oriented, amen? I may have my retirement all in place. I may be an executive director of the largest, I may own Walmart. <laughs> or whatever is the biggest one this week, amen? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, according to the word of God, if my number one goal is not developing the character of Christ, I do not have God's predetermined goal for my <laughs> life, period. So, I mean, it's just a simple question. Where are you on this deal? <laughs> Amen. Um, is your goal God's goal? If it ain't, as we say over in Fort Smith, 
maybe we ought to have a little adjustment of goals, a little goal-setting um, memorandi. You know, get up in the morning, you know, you ever been through the goal thing, you know, success in life kind of stuff, and you get up and the first thing you do is go through your to-do list? The first thing on our to-do list ought to be, I'm going to become like Christ. What do you want me to do today, Lord, to develop your character, your nature in my life? That ought to be at the top of my to-do list. Anything else is not of God if it's at the top. This says the word of God, okay? That ain't Chuck. That's not Chuck. All right, last point. Jesus, perfecter of our salvation. Last part of uh, Hebrews 2, verse 10. For it's fitting in bringing many sons to glory that he for whom and through whom all things exist should make the source of their salvation, the architect of their salvation, perfect through sufferings. A lot, there's been a lot of confusion about that. The, well, the question kind of comes, well, was Jesus not already perfect? Why did he have to suffer? You know, did he have to suffer? Did he have to go through Calvary to beco become perfect? I thought he was. Well, he was. Let me tell you, that word, the Greek word there is a word, uh, we pronounce it something like te telestai. All right, it's the word when Jesus is on the cross. Remember it says, and he lifted up his head, and with a loud voice he cried out, it is finished. Remember that? That's the, the, he said this one word, the same word, te telestai. It's finished. Uh, the Hebrew word or the Aramaic word that was spoken is a word you're probably familiar with, shalom. That's what he cried out, shalom. And that we typically translate that word as peace, you know, may the shalom, may the peace of God be with you. But it's much deeper, much richer than that. It means, if I were to put it into our English language, it means to complete. It's completed. That's why the English of, the, of uh, the cross says, it is finished, it is completed. You see, Christ was perfect. But what he completed, when he died on the cross, he completely paid the price for our salvation. And the architectural wonder of eternity was put in place. And he's calling you to be sons and daughters <laughs> of that glory. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we come before you this morning <clears throat> with grateful hearts for your architectural wonder, your great design, your great purpose of this whole salvation wonder designed ultimately to bring us into your presence filled with the glory of your Son. Wow. Lord, embed in our hearts, as, as King David would pray, O oh God, create in me a clean heart, a pure heart. As Samuel would say, that your eyes are looking to and fro over this whole earth, looking for someone whose heart is perfect toward you. Lord, give us that heart. Create in us a heart that is perfectly dedicated to you, your purpose, your plan for our lives and for our purpose in this world, the mission, the ministry, life you've called us to. Open our eyes. Help us to see. 
And you put us all in different places, different jobs, different vocations, occupations for your glory. To be an influence, to touch others, to help others, to pray for others. Lord, open our eyes for your glory. Lord, if there's a soul here this morning that has not come under the blood, who's not turned away from the, their old life of seeking, 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 fulfillment, happiness, whatever. Lord, bring them to the cross for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Jennifer, you lead us. Whatever the Lord would have you do this morning, do it right now. This is his invitation. You respond to him.